Hello, my name is Izzy, and I'm going to be reading A Good Girl's Guide to Murder by Holly Jackson. Um, I'm recording, I'm a guest on a podcast called Fiddle and Pipe, where we are talking about the book, and I didn't really see any good audio recordings out there on YouTube. I like listening to it sometimes while I read sped up, so um, it helps me kind of get into the book, I guess. So if you're like that too, I hope you enjoy. Um, I'm not a professional reader, but I'm going to try my best, so... I'm going to start at chapter one. Chapter one. Pip knew where they lived. Everyone in Fairview knew where they lived. Their home was like the town's own haunted house. People's footsteps quickened as they walked by, and their words strangled and died in their throats. Shrieking children would gather on their walk home from school, daring one another to run up and touch the front gate. But it wasn't haunted by ghosts, just three sad people trying to live their lives as before, a house not haunted by flickering lights or spectral falling chairs, but by dark spray-painted letters of scum family and stone-shattered windows. Pip had always wondered why they didn't move. Not that they had to. They hadn't done anything wrong. But she didn't know how they lived like that, how the Sings found the strength to stay here. Here, in Fairview, under the weight of so many widened eyes, of the comments whispered just loud enough to be heard, of neighborly small talk never stretching into real talk anymore. It was a particularly cruel that their house was so close to Fairview High School, where both Andy Bell and Sal Singh had gone, where Pip would return for her senior year in a few weeks when the late summer sun dipped into September. Pip stopped and rested her hand on the front gate, instantly braver than half the town's kids. Her eyes traced the path to the front door. It was possible that this was a very bad idea, and she had considered that. Pausing just for a second, Pip held her breath, then pushed the creaking gate and crossed the yard. She stopped at the door and knocked three times. Her reflection stared back at her, the long, dark hair, sun-bleached, a lighter brown at the tips, the pale white skin, despite a week just spent in the Caribbean, the sharp, muddy green eyes braced for impact. The door opened with a clatter of a falling chain and clicking locks. Hello, he said, holding the door half open with his hand folded over the side. Pip blinked to break her stare, but she couldn't help it. He looked so much like Sal, the Sal she knew from all those television reports and newspaper pictures, the Sal now fading from her memory. Ravi had his brother's messy black, side-swept hair, thick arched eyebrows, and oaken-hued skin. Hello, he said again. Um, Pitt faltered. He'd grown even taller since she last saw him. She'd never been this close before, but now that she was, she saw he had a dimple in his chin, just like hers. Um, sorry, Hi. She did an awkward half-wave that she immediately regretted. Hi? Hi, Ravi, she said. I, you don't know me. I'm Pippa Fitzamobi. I was a few years below you at school before you left. Okay. I was just wondering if I could borrow a second of your time. Well, not only a second. We're already way past that. Maybe a few sequential seconds, if you can spare them? Oh, God. This is what happened when she was nervous. Words spewed out, unchecked, and over-explained until someone stopped her. Ravi looked confused. Sorry, Pip said, recovering. I mean, I'm doing my senior capstone project at school, and... What's a capstone project? It's kind of like a senior thesis you work on independently alongside normal classes. You can pick any topic you want, and I was wondering if you'd be willing to be interviewed for mine? What's it about? His dark eyebrows hugged closer to his eyes. Um, it's about what happened five years ago. Ravi exhaled loudly, his lip curling with what looked like anger. Why? He said. Because I don't think your brother did it, and I'm going to try to prove it. Pippa Fitz Amobi, 73019, Capstone Project Log, Entry 1. Our capstone project logs are supposed to be for recording any obstacles we face in our research, our progress, and the aims of our final reports. Mine will have to be a little different. I'm going to record all my research here, both relevant and irrelevant, because I don't really know what my final report will be yet or what will end up being important. I will just have to wait and see where I'm at after all my investigating and what essay I can bring together. I'm hoping it will not be the topic I proposed to Mrs. Morgan. I'm hoping it will be the truth, what really happened to Andy Bell on April 18th, 2014. And if, as my instincts tell me, Salil, Sal, Singh is not guilty, then who killed her? I don't think I'll actually solve the case and figure out who murdered Andy. I'm not deluded. 
but I'm hoping my findings might lead to reasonable doubt about Sal's guilt and suggest that the police were mistaken in closing the case without digging further. The first stage in this project is to research what happened to Andrea Bell, known to everyone as Andy, and the circumstances surrounding her disappearance. From the first national online news outlet to report on the event. Andrea Bell, 17, was reported missing from her home in Fairview, Connecticut last Friday. She left home in her car, a white Honda Civic, with her cell phone, but did not take any clothes with her. Police say her disappearance is completely out of character. Police began searching the woodland near the family home this past weekend. Andrea, known as Andy, is described as white, five feet, six inches tall, with long blonde hair and blue eyes. It is thought that she was wearing dark jeans and a blue cropped sweater on the night she went missing. Other sources had more details as to when Andy had last seen, been seen alive, the time frame in which she is believed to have been abducted. Andy Bell was last seen alive by her younger sister, Becca, around 10.30 p.m. on April 18, 2014. This was corroborated by police in a press conference on Tuesday, April 22nd. Footage taken from a security camera outside the bank on Fairview's Main Street confirms that Andy's car was seen driving away from her home at about 10.40 p.m. According to her parents, Jason and Don Bell, Andy was supposed to pick them up from a dinner party at 12.45 a.m. When Andy didn't show up or answer any of their phone calls, they started reaching out to her friends to see if anyone knew of the, her whereabouts. Jason Bell called the police to report his daughter missing at 3 o'clock a.m. Saturday morning. So whatever happened to Andy Bell that night happened between 10.40 p.m. and 12.45 a.m. Here seems like a good place to type up the transcript for my interview with Angela Johnson. Transcript of the interview with Angela Johnson from the Missing Persons Bureau. Angela. Hello? Pip. Hi, is this Angela Johnson? Angela. Speaking, yep. Is this Pippa? Pip. Yes, thank you so much for replying to my email. Do you mind if I record this interview for my project? Angela. Yeah, that's fine. I'm sorry. I've only gotten about 10 minutes. So what do you want to know about missing persons? Pip. Well, I was wondering if you could talk me through what happens when someone is reported missing. What's the process and first steps taken by the police? Angela. When someone is reported missing, the police will try to get as much detail as possible so they can identify the potential risk to the missing person and an appropriate police response can be made. They'll ask for name, age, description, the clothes they were last seen wearing, the circumstances of their disappearance, if going missing is out of character for this person, details of any vehicle involved. Using this information, the police will determine whether this is an at-risk missing persons case. Pip. In what circumstances would make it an at-risk case? Angela. If they are vulnerable because of their age or disability, or if the behavior is out of character, which indicates they could have been exposed to harm. Pip. Um, so if the missing person is 17 years old and is deemed out of character for her to go missing, would that be considered an at-risk case? Angela. Absolutely, when a minor is involved. Pip. So how would the police respond? Angela. Well, there would be an immediate deployment of police officers to the location the person is missing from. The officers will get further information about the missing person, such as details of their friends or partners, any health conditions, financial information in case they try to withdraw money. Police will also need recent photographs and might take DNA samples in case they're needed for subsequent forensic examinations. And with consent of the homeowners, the location would be searched thoroughly to see if the missing person is concealed or hiding there and to establish whether there are any further evidential leads. Pip. So immediately the police are looking for any clues or suggestions that the person missing has been a victim of a crime? Angela. Absolutely. If the circumstances of the disappearance are suspicious, officers are instructed to document evidence early on, as though they were investigating a murder. Of course, only a small percentage of missing persons cases turn into homicide cases. Pip. And what happens if nothing significant turns up after the initial home search? Angela. They'll expand the search to the immediate area. They'll question friends, neighbors, anyone who might have relevant information. If it is a teenager who's missing, we can't assume the reporting parents know all of their child's friends and acquaintances. Peers are good points of contact to establish other important leads. You know, any secret boyfriends, that sort of thing. And a press strategy is usually discussed because appeals for information in the media can be very useful in these situations. Pip. So if it's a 17-year-old girl who's gone missing, the police would contact her friends and boyfriend early on. Angela, yes, of course. Inquiries will be made because if the missing person has run away, they are likely to be hiding out with someone close to them. Pip, and at what point in a missing person's case do police assume they're looking for a body? Angela, well, time-wise, it's not... Oh, Pippa, I'm sorry, I have to go. 
I've been called into a meeting. Pip. Oh, okay. Thanks so much for taking the time to talk to me. Angela. And if you have more questions, just shoot me an email and I'll get to it when I can. Pip. Will do. Thanks again. I found these statistics. 80% of missing people are found in the first 24 hours. 97% are found in the first week. And 99% of the case are resolved in the first year. That leaves just 1%. 1% of people who disappear are never found, and just 0.25% of all missing persons cases have a fatal outcome. So where does this leave Andy Bell, floating incessantly somewhere between 1% and 0.25%? Even though Andy has never been found and her body never recovered, most people accept that she is dead. And why is that? Sal Singh is why. End of chapter one.